first of all, what is the objective, what it is that we want uh, to achieve. I mean, basically, I would say there are three key elements. The first one, we want to be sure that regulators from both sides of the Atlantic, as they consider the new regulations, they are ready to explore all possible options to achieve compatible regulatory regimes. In some cases, this can take the form of uh, mutual recognition, equivalency, substitute compliance, whichever way uh, you want uh, to call it. In some cases, you may envisage to have regulations which are very close to each other, perhaps even harmonized uh, regulations, but we would want to be sure that on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, the regulators from both sides, as they deal with new regulatory challenge, they explored uh, all possible options to make their regulatory regimes uh, compatible. Secondly, uh, we want to be sure that regulators also cooperate much better than they have done in the past in international fora because many of these uh, regulatory challenges are not discussed in a purely bilateral setting. They are being discussed in international uh, organizations, where it is the G20, where it is the UNECE for car safety regulations, where it is ISO for standards. These are all international organizations which have a responsibility to develop international regulations, principal norms, and the more that the US regulators and the European regulators cooperate closely, the more that we can influence uh, uh, the agenda. The more that each one of us is uh, just focused on, in his, on his domestic perspective, the lesser that our influence is going to be. And I think that as time passes, this influence is going to, to diminish. So this is, I think, uh, a second important objective. And certainly, a very fundamental principle that it would apply in all cases, nothing of what we would be doing could in any way lead to a weakening of the level of protection which is uh, underlined uh, the regulations that, uh, that are going to be discussed. So there's no uh, question about, in any case, compromising prudential regulation for trade concerns or compromising the environmental protection for trade concerns. The question is, can we actually frame our regulations in a manner that while achieving our objectives, we avoid uh, unnecessary regulatory, <laughs> regulatory uh, uh, conflicts? Uh, so this is the bond, is the first point, this is the overall objective about what we are trying to achieve through this regulatory coherence <coughs> uh, chapter. Now, which are the tools, which are the instruments? The first one I would say, early consultations. I mean, if we want to have an influence on our respective uh, regulatory regimes, it would be important that this discussion between regulators takes place as early as possible. If discussions take place when the, the regulator has already fully made up uh, his or her mind about how he or she wants to regulate, uh, this is probably very difficult at that point in time to have uh, an influence. We would want to have a system in which uh, if one of the two sides is considering to develop a regulation which could have a significant impact on transatlantic trade uh, and investment, this should be flagged. And if the other side uh, is interested uh, on having a discussion on the regulatory options, there should be a possibility for both sides uh, to explore those options at an early stage and to continue those uh, consultations, discussions as the regulatory procedure uh, at, <coughs> at uh, advances. Secondly, both the United States and the European Union have developed uh, institutional mechanisms to carry out an assessment of proposed regulations. In the case of the European Union, we have impact assessments, which is a requirement uh, at least for any legislative proposal. In the case of the United States, you have cost-benefit analysis, which is the, needs to be developed for all regulatory, all regulatory initiatives. And what we would want to be sure is that both uh, mechanisms for assessment take into account the external trade impact. Now, we are not saying that you would add another layer of uh, analysis, but that you would be sure that within the context of impact assessment or cost-benefit uh, uh, analysis, external trade impacts can be, can be factored in and can be, and can be analyzed. Certainly, we would want uh, that there is a clear um, readiness, commitment by both sides upon request to examine uh, the possibility for the equivalency of regulatory regimes based on outcomes. Now, this is something that needs to be assessed on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, but if one side uh, considers that uh, 
there is the element, say, for having the recognition of equivalency of regulatory uh, regimes. This should be something that the other side should be ready to explore, to discuss. At the end of the day, it's a decision of the regulator, so the regulator will always keep uh, his regulatory autonomy to decide whether or not he considers uh, that the criteria are met. But uh, we would need to be sure that there is a clear uh, commitment to enter into a substantive uh, uh, discussion on these issues upon the request uh, of the of the other uh, side. Finally, for all of this to work, I think we need an institutional mechanism because I think these are not things which are just going to happen to, on their own. It would be important that uh, once we have it in place, we have the institutional mechanism that favors uh, close cooperation between the regulators. That's why we have put this forward, this idea of setting up with entity what we have called uh, a regulatory cooperation council. You can give it a different name if you want, but the key idea will be to ensure that in the same way that the regulators have been fully engaged in the process of uh, negotiating this agreement, they should also be fully engaged in the process of uh, implementation and development uh, of the agreement. And of course, it will be done without in any way putting in question the regulatory autonomy of his site. I mean, it's not that the regulatory cooperation council is going to develop jointly uh, transatlantic regulations. Regulations will be developed in the United States in accordance with their domestic procedures, will be developed in the European Union in accordance with our domestic procedures, but hopefully based on a significant substantial dialogue between the two uh, regulators to try to make sure that the regulations, if possible, are as compatible uh, as they could be. And finally, to make clear that although I have been talking all the time about uh, regulators, we are not suggesting that this is just something that regulators will do uh, with behind closed doors. Uh, we certainly will also want to reflect uh, about the best way of ensuring that there is a good process of a stakeholder uh, uh, consultation. There are different procedures in the United States than in the European Union, but in any case, uh, we would want to be sure that all of these uh, regulatory work in TTIP is also done in a manner where stakeholders have the possibility to, to make an input. Of course, stakeholders is all stakeholders. It cannot just be one particular group of, of stakeholders. So that, if you want, is to give you a sense of the type uh, of elements that we believe uh, we should aim to achieve in the context of this um, regulatory coherent chapter. We still haven't really started uh, to negotiate on a text. Uh, so far we have had uh, a lot of uh, discussions with our American friends uh, at the conceptual level. We have also explored uh, to have a better understanding about how our respective regulatory systems work. We expect that probably by September, where we will have another round of negotiations, we may already have reached a stage in which both sides have put on the table their own proposals about uh, this regulatory coherence chapter, and we will begin to see then how this can be merged and, uh, and put, uh, <coughs> and put um, uh, together. Perhaps finally, just one word about more about the general picture where we are. Uh, we will have a round of negotiations uh, next week. Uh, it would be a comprehensive round in which nearly all topics uh, would, be, would be discussed. <laughs> we would then probably have another round uh, by the end of September. We still haven't got a precise date. And in the month of October, there will be a meeting between Commissioner De Gutt and Ambassador Fromant uh, to take uh, a stock about uh, where we have uh, arrived in the negotiation at that, uh, at that particular point in time. We certainly hope that on the regulatory part of TTIP, uh, both horizontal and sectorial issues, we have made uh, sufficient uh, progress in the discussions between now and the time of the political, uh, of the political stock taking.